diagnosis of hypertension, we are over focusing on the blood pressure, but I think the IUGR can assist us a lot in actually managing the mortality. And then we're gonna look at hypertension was changed, the prevention and actually the management postpartum. And then the most last but not least, we're gonna talk about obstetric hemorrhage. Bleeding after cesarean section is a major problem for us in the Eastern Cape. So in a nutshell, I just want to say that Okay, so in a nutshell, basically, the target for maternal mortality is 100 deaths per 100,000 deliveries. So we can see that in the past three years, we've come from 132, 121 to 110, and therefore Eastern Cape ranks fourth among the other provinces. And you can see that we have a maternal mortality on average of 121, with the Western Cape sitting at 65, followed by KZN, Kauteng, and then ourselves. Why is it this session important? We really appreciate and applaud Medellin for putting this together because we can see that where do the, 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 the deaths happen? So when we do the analysis of maternal deaths, we talk about triennium. So there was a triennium 2014 to 2016. The next triennium was 2017 to 2019. So with this triennium, we, we compare the number of deaths. So it's obvious that you can see on the left-hand side that there was a total of 487 uh, deaths and then in the triennium 2017 to 2019, there was 355 deaths. So if we're looking where most of the deaths happen, of course, most of the deaths will happen in a national central hospital, which you can see there were 100 deaths at 28%. Then if we're looking at our, our, our level three hospital is free. So you can see that it's, it's having 9.5% of the deaths. But then between the five regional hospitals and the district hospitals, you can see that 29, 26.9, Yes, happen in the regional hospital and 26 in the district hospital. So we want to reduce the 26 in the, in the regional hospitals. Okay, by provinces, I mean, we've got eight districts in the province and we can see now they were, we were making good progress until 2010 came, 2020 came where there was COVID. So you can see that our maternal death then moved from 121, um, from 125 to 159 in 2020. And that was hugely as an impact of COVID. And definitely OR Tambo, you can see Nelson Mandela Academic had 70 of those 159 deaths. And, and then you can see that um, where there's metros, like Buffalo City, where there's metros and two hospitals, there's more deaths sitting at about 30. And then you can see that Nelson Mandela Bay and Chris Annie, because they have regional hospitals, have got more deaths than the other smaller districts that actually refer to them. What are the top causes of maternal deaths? So basically, if we're looking in the middle column in Eastern Cape, our top cause was what we call non-pregnancy-related infections. And before COVID came, we're looking in the middle column. So HIV, with its complication, was accounting for 29% of the maternal deaths. And then second problem for us in the Eastern Cape was obstetric hemorrhage. So which we were sitting at 22 mortality, and then we had then hypotensive disorders. And then this was followed with medical and surgical disorders. This is purely patients that actually have underlying, they've got cancer, more, most of them with cardiac disease, you know, renal disease that then happen to fall pregnant. But that's a failure of our system because we don't counsel people on contraceptives. But let's look at what has happened in 2020. When COVID came, new trends are actually emerging. What has you see that actually COVID Oh, accounted for the majority of the deaths, which is at 18.9. And there were 33 deaths from COVID in our, in our facilities in 2020. And then that was followed by, so you can see that under non-pregnancy related infection, now you've got COVID as well as the HIV-like complications. And then again, as I was telling you, obstetric hemorrhage then becomes our major problem. And then we have seen an improvement in the deaths from hypertension, which I'm going to talk about why and what maybe has changed. But what is emerging is the suicide deaths, which we need to deal with. So if you can see in the national picture, Caesars, right? So in 2017, 2018, we launched this thing of these hub hospitals, 24 hour Caesar hospitals, where now instead of only the regional and the tertiary hospitals doing 24 hour Caesars, we added 16 hospitals to do 24 hour scissors so that district hospitals could cluster together so that scissors could be done. And I think as a result of that, we can see that 
if you're looking at Eastern Cape, our case fatality related to CISA has improved. But here's the downside. If you look at this slide, you're looking at the bleeding, that case fatality associated with bleeding associated with cesarean delivery. So there is a definite skill gap here. We need to practice, we need competence assessment. So there's something called the safe CISA plan. And what it, it mandates is that doctors, as they arrive in the district hospitals, they must be assessed by a more senior person in that district hospital or go outside to be assessed by somebody else for their competence to give anesthesia and maybe to actually deal with the high spina and then to actually do the scissor itself. So for the purpose of this talk, I'm not going to, to deal with those issues like how to do a scissor because there's already an online recorded training which then has got all the videos about how do you deal with bleeding, how do you get the head out, how do you deal with a difficult scissor. So I, I want to encourage everyone to watch the surgical skills module on the ESMO online. So the uh, this is just about showing us the things. Now let's look at why the mothers died. So when we look at avoidable factors, we start by looking at avoidable factors and we classify them. So the top avoidable factor colleagues in the province is lack of appropriately trained doctors. So that's where this training comes in. And, and that is sitting at 65%, the people who assessed the chart felt that the doctor was not appropriately trained. And that was eight contributing 18.2 and level of appropriate. Level of level of and then the second issue was the transport. So transport, 10% of the administrative problems. And then there were two other issues. This delay in initiating critical care as well as the ICU. So we find a lot of the times you are sitting with a patient, you want them transported or they've arrived at the regional and central hospitals, but there are some delays in initiating care or there are no ICU beds. So patients may deteriorate and die in the process. So what are the medical personnel issues? So if we look at the district hospital and the CHCs, this is the blue line in the graph. Definitely initial assessment <laughs> and poor. Problem recognition is actually poor. Sometimes there are delays in referring the patient or just keeping them inappropriately at the wrong level, keep a patient at the district hospital when they should have been transferred earlier. But one of the issues in the regional and the tertiary hospitals, really we've got this prolonged abnormal monitoring with no action uh, as, a, as a bigger issue with the regional and tertiary hospitals or substandard care, even if the diagnosis is actually correct. But this may be an issue of overcrowding in those hospitals. So re causing people to actually have problems uh, uh, with poor monitoring. So I'm going to then discuss specific medical issues, but if you're looking at the confidential inquiries, we are focusing on five things. You can see HIV, obstetric hemorrhage, hypertension, heart disease, as well as the first half of pregnancy. You can read the slide at your own convenience. So let's go to the clinical thing. So that's the picture. Doctors, training, nurse training, delay, initiating critical care, lack of ICUs, what have we done? We know that with COVID, we started creating OptiFlows, high flow nasal oxygen. Remember that high flow nasal oxygen is not only relevant for patients with COVID, but for patients with pulmonary edema with severe hypertension. So at least we started putting the, the equipment in those hospitals, we've expanded the beds, isolation beds. So hopefully if there is a third wave, it may actually assist us. So let me just talk with the first so I'm going to be more specific. I'm talking about the first half of pregnancy. And the, my first thing is about you are in casualty. You walk in, the patient has a pre positive pregnancy test. You pee with them, the os is closed. Okay, and now what do you do? Is she a threatened miscarriage? Could she be an ectopic? How are you going to tell the difference? So really it's important that if you're in casualty, pregnancy test must be done. All right, you must scan. You have ultrasound machines to scan. But what if you see nothing, right? Okay, so how do you decide? If you cannot see much on the ultrasound and most of you will actually do abdominal ultrasound, what should you do? So the ideal thing is really to take a beta CG. So you can either if the patient's very stable, send her home or she can come back the next day and really want to take a beta CG. So what's the bottom line? If the beta CG levels are less than 1.5, with a trans abdominal ultrasound, you will see nothing. So I think the bottom line is that if your beta issues are less than 1.5, transabdominal scan, you'll see nothing. But 
it's very important that you do a transvaginal scan. And if you see a vitality of more than 1.5 on transvaginal scan, you will see something. But when you scan, what is important is that if the, the fetus is six weeks, you will see a fetal pole and you will see a fetal heart. So when you think the pregnancy is six weeks, you still should see those things so that the pregnancy is viable. Now, if you're using an abdominal scan, you're really looking at the ICGs of more than 5,000. And if we've got more than 5,000, then you should be able to see something clearly in an abdominal scan. So if despite these results, then your uterus is empty, then you consider this as an octopic, and we want a high index of suspicion. The second scenario you're going to come across is miscarriage. We know as we walk around most of the times, there is this piece of posters that say free painless abortion, you know, and these pictures, there is unsafe abortion. As much as we have TOP services, we know that most of our hospitals don't have termination of pregnancy services. So what happens is that people are doing an illegal trade of buying mysoprostol from the street. And then when they buy mysoprostol from the street, they then present to the hospital, say, I have a discharge, I'm bleeding. Because those yeah, return, and those yeah, return products actually so now I just want us to go through. We're still in the casualty, not in the maternity. Here is a patient that is coming. So when you see a patient, it's important we, in ESMO, we say you call a cab. You always check what are the vitals that you've been given. It's a C and A, a B. What is the blood pressure? Is the patient breathing? The airway is open and what's the respiratory rate? So when you get presented with any patient that has abnormal vitals, so normally we do the temperature. Definitely, if a patient has a heart rate of more than 90, respirations of more than 20, the temperature, you need to take a white cell count. And these patients have got systemic inflammatory response syndrome, and they need to be admitted. This type of patients with these vitals and normal respiration rate in patients is 12 that are not pregnant or early pregnant. So once it exceeds 20, these patients must be admitted. Started on antibiotics, and then you can review what happened. Now, when you examine them, sometimes the source of the sepsis or the infection is not very clear. Like you can say that I can come feeling funny with the temperature, then two or three days later, I will develop an appendicitis. If it's a child with a, I mean, with a tonsillitis, or you develop an, ab an abdominal. So what is very important, colleagues, there's this tendency that people just don't have a full examination. People just look at the main complaint. We need, we are emphasizing that examine people properly, big five systems. Check their alertness, our blood pressure, the respiratory rate, examine the abdomen, and look at the urine dipsticks and look at the volume. And if it's necessary, you need to assess these things. And we can know that there's something we refer to as a shock index. So whenever you get presented with a blood pressure and the pulse, most people, your pulse will be 60 and your blood pressure will be 110. So most people will have shock index of 0 0.5. So if at any time your systolic blood pressure and your pulse are equal, that's a problem. If your pulse exceeds systolic blood pressure, the patient is shocked. Whether it's shocked from hypovolemia or it's actually shocked from Then there is, when you're evaluating organs, it's always important that you look at the forgotten form. What is this? This is HP and hematological HP. And as I've talked to the, HIV, the white cell count, always know the patient's HIV status and check their temperature. All patients, you need to check the glucose if they're a bit sick, and then also look for evidence of DVT. And then if you think the patient has a problem with the uterus or they have a miscarriage or whatever, then you can examine the core system, which is actually the main obstetric thing. So we say, do the big five examination, then you go to the forgotten for always have an HP plate, HIV status, and examine. When we're talking muscular skeletal, you look for the presence of a DVT, but you also look at other signs of sepsis. And where, where, where are you going to find these signs? You're going to find spontaneous bruising or, you know, uh, or when you put up drips, then the drips start tissuing. So that could be signs that the patient is septic. And then on the obstetrics, you'll actually find signs of a miscarriage or a septic miscarriage with all many smelling products and a big uterine size. So how, when do you then say a patient has got severe sepsis? So when you do the big five examination then, Things that will be a marker that maybe this person needs high care, needs more intensive or monitoring, they have severe sepsis, is actually when your blood pressures are less than on the big five systems, then you're going to find the BPs are less than 90 respirations. You can see now, instead of being 20, they are now at 26. Your urine is less than 30 mils an hour. And then altered mental status, you know, they are cold, hyperlactemia. So just on your general examination, the big five systems will actually alert you to the presence of severe sepsis. 
what are you supposed to do? I think one of the biggest pitfalls for doctors, people will say admit to the ward. A patient that does have vitals that are in keeping with sepsis will just get admitted to the ward. So what are you supposed to do? When you write up your treatment plan, the treatment plans must be specific. They must put the fluids. What does it say? Fluid resuscitation is the most important management for sepsis. So you need to write up the fluids at 20 mils per kg. Right? That's why there was this principle of putting two drips and one line, one liter on the side, one liter on that other side, because that was going to give you, for a 100 kg person, it's going to give you two liters. So you need to do that. So whether you're seeing a child and adult or what, you need to put the fluids, write them up, prescribe them, and let them be given in front of your eyes before the patients go to casualty. And then if after you've done that, you repeat the vitals and the vitals must be repeated and you, the admitting doctor, must review that. So if you then continue to have hypoperfusion and multi-organ dysfunction, despite having given these fluids, then we actually say the patient is in septic shock. And so what will you do? When you think the patient is in septic shock, I've already told you, do the fluids. Then the second thing is antibiotics. The first person to see casualties must all have antibiotics and you must give IV antibiotics within the first hour before you transfer the patient to the ward or to the next level. You don't know what's gonna happen when they get to the ward. So this is treatment that must be started within a casual or an emergency setting. Blood cultures, before you draw for the, 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 the before you, you give the IV antibiotics, you do blood culture. You don't know where's the source of infection. So take blood, take urine, take sputum if it's necessary and then examine the patient. And then there's a principle which is called now, you source identify and site control. So even before you found the site of the infection, the fluids, the antibiotics, taking the cultures is important. And then you want to source identify of which any other investigations will depend on what you've identified as the source. Now I'm gonna share some two silly stories. When you are trying to find the cause of sepsis, you must think big systems, right? So for example, you may have a patient that had that had a Caesar, all right? So if the patient has a Caesar and now is coming up with septic and looking ill, what could be the problem? They could have a meningitis, endocarditis, they could have a UTI, they had a catheter, someone could have injured the bowel, they could have a DVT, they could have an endometritis, they could have a breast abscess, or they could have been aspirated. So if you want to remember something from this lecture, think about this picture. I'm gonna tell you two stories about the pitfalls. One patient that, was a complication that I had, was a patient that came in 10 days post Caesar. And when she comes and she says, I'm not feeling well, I've just got vague GIT symptoms and all that. But what was the wrong thing the doctor did? The doctor decided to ultrasound the patient and they found no abnormality. So they said, oh, ultrasound is normal, you can go, everything is fine. Ultrasound is not relevant in sepsis. You can check it to actually check if you've got products. But when you've had surgery, right? It's actually important to do an X-ray because you know what, five days later, she still came back with the same complaints and somebody else decided to X-ray, leave the ultrasound because the findings are usually vague. But when they X-ray, they found a retained swab, okay? So despite all the good news, she had a swab in the abdomen and that was very important. The second thing is always examine the breasts. So if you can, if you examine the patient and you don't find, so I had a patient that I found that was not feeling well and everything. And I did all my examination to find the source of this and I didn't find it. And then right at the end, when I thought, I don't know what's wrong with this patient, I opened their breast. And this patient had the worst, a big breast, mastitis. And I'm saying, ma'am, why did you let me do all these investigations instead of telling me that you've got this big painful breast? So she said, what is wrong with the breast? So I was surprised by her question. But then she said, you know what, in our culture, they tell us if the baby peps on your breast, you will develop a, a severe mastitis and a cellulitis. So I thought this was normal because this baby peps on this breast. So that's why I thought this was present. So you can have a massive breast abscess, but this will not be vomited by the patient. So these are the things to talk about. The last one part is antibiotics. We do not use gentamicin in pregnancy, but patients that are early pregnancy with miscarriage and after pregnancy with piperacepsis. sepsis, Use triple antibiotics. The gentamicin is very important because the gentamicin will cover your gram negatives, which is what is very important in use of flagellate and your third generation cephalosporin. Now let's just talk about miscarriage. So I just want to make a, a simple example that if the patient 
when, before you go to theater, you will see lots of miscarriages and in the district hospital, you do lots of effects. But I want to caution you, when you find that you, you have got abnormal vitals like hypoperfusion, or you know the patient has a tachycardia, you must think twice about going in to evict a patient. Before you evict anyone, they must have antibiotics on board for two hours before you go and evict. Now, if there are any signs of septic, it's better to then discuss this patient with a, a higher level so that they, they, a person needs to decide whether the patient needs an evict or a hysterectomy. So when we say source identify and source control, you may find that a patient has septic products. One patient that we took to theater who debated whether we should do an evict and a hysterectomy, this girl was 22 years old. And our boss said, no, this patient needs a hysterectomy. And we're thinking, sure, 22 years, you have a hysterectomy for retained products. But the feeling was that this patient is persistently hypotensive and is having a tachy and is not passing enough urine. Definitely, we decided to go and do the evict. But you know what? The patient crashed. As we got out the patient out of theater after the event, because when you evacuate a person, you actually release the gram negatives that have been contained in the uterus. And then those organisms go into the bloodstream. And then after going to the bloodstream, then it puts the patient into septic shock. And then the patients deteriorated, needed ICU, needed dialysis, needed ventilation. But when you do what is effective source identification and control, the best thing for that patient was to do a hysterectomy because you're not going to tamper with the organisms inside the uterus. You're going to clear the source way beyond the site of the infection. And in that way, we could have saved the patient. So it's a, it's a bad decision, but the indications for taking a patient, doing a hysterectomy on a patient with miscarriage are really two organ systems. So persistent hypotension and renal dysfunction, or if the uterus after has been evacuated remains larger than six weeks, then you need to consider that with one organ dysfunction. Then I just want to teach you, because we work in a casualty setting and we don't have high care beds, there's something called a passive straight leg raise. So let's say you see a patient and then you give her uh, fluids, uh, an adequate fluid for life, and therefore the patient doesn't improve. So maybe you put voluven, put crystalloids, then you put voluven, still the patient doesn't improve. What do you need to do? Now, normally you are near catch 22 because you don't know now if the problem is inotropic support or the patient is actually septic and needs more fluid. So in order to do that, instead of now going for your, for your fourth liter of fluid after giving two or three, you need to start doing this passive straight leg raise. So what do you do? You put the patient at 45 degrees and then you put them, you make them lie so fine. And then what do you do? You record your pulse in the blood pressure. So what you want to do is you want to create an auto transfusion. Basically you elevate the legs of the bed and then this is, will, will create all the fluid that was sitting in the leg is going to go into the intravascular compartment. And then when that happens, you raise only one leg, you wait for two minutes and then you record the blood pressure and the pulse. And if you record it, and therefore there's improvement after this passive straight leg raise test of 10% in the pulse or in the BP, then it means this patient is actually was behind in terms of fluids. Then you can start putting another fluid. But if the patient, as soon as you do the, the straight leg raise test, they start coughing, they sort of in a pulmonary edema, the fluid all overloaded, then you can drop the leg and that sim those symptoms will actually become, become better. And then you know that, okay, this patient, what they need is actually uh, adrenaline. So in, in that context, yes, adrenaline will use it in the high care setting, but before you time the patient, instead of keeping them hypotensive, you can put five mils or in 200 mils of pneumocellin, you run them at five mils an hour. And then what the, but the main caution is that if you're gonna give any fluid with adrenaline in the district hospital setting, then it's very important that you don't use a small line. You don't use a peripheral vein, which is in the hands. You use a big, like a green, a, a green or a gray gel core. And then if you've given a fluid with adrenaline, you need to flush it, you, you know? So it's very important so that that adrenaline doesn't stay on the vessels when you put it. Come on, you can, you can damage those vessels. Okay, so, sorry. Okay, I'm done with sepsis and miscarriage. I hope you've got my point. Pay attention, recognize unsafe abortion, put patients, uh, put your fluids before you send patients to the world, start antibiotics, do your cultures and review your vitals, and then decide if the patient is eligible to stay in your hospital or if the patient has not improved after an hour of fluids and antibiotics and, and then you need to transfer the patient to the second level and discuss with another consultant or you keep.
Now I'm coming to the next issue, which is actually our anti-retaliation. Okay. The main, risk, the main problems happening with antenatal care colleagues is that there are patients that need to be seen by the nurses at the clinics, and there are patients that need to be seen at the hospital, and there are patients where we need to have combined care. So how do the nurses, I never understood this, so I will talk about it. How do the nurses decide if the patients need to come to the district hospital high risk? So there is a checklist, right? It's got seven, 21 factors. So obstetric history, previous loss, recurrent miscarriage, babies, preterm, babies more than four kgs, preeclampsia and the last or they have previous seizure, my nectarum and all those things. So that will be on the past history. So if a person answers yes to any of these questions, then they are referred. In the current pregnancy, twins, age less than 18, age more than 37, patients who are Irish negative, they are not bleeding, pelvic mess, or then patients who have problems with hypertension. And then you've got the other patients with general medical condition, diabetes, cardiac, renal failure, epilepsy, asthma, TB, or any substance abusers in any other condition. So if the patient ticks yes, yes, some of these conditions, these patients need to come to the district hospital, but some of the cases, the patients need to be managed jointly with the clinic. So you can give them, but visit at the clinics also, you can tell them to come to high risk. But what in all that, the management plan must be very clear to the clinic sister that, this will be shared care, or you will come back. This patient will only, like if it's a previous season, she can then only come back at 36 weeks unless a new problem occurs. So I think it's very important. Yes, other patients like the cardiacs and the diabetes, they need tertiary level um, care, you know, to have their echoes and all that. So I think it's very important when you manage your high risk and understand why patients are sent. And when you send them back, you must be very clear why you're sending them back. So then also the visits. It's very important to note that Patients need to have more visits, at least two weekly visits in the last trimester. So patients normally come first booking 20, 26 weeks, 30 weeks, 34 weeks, 36 weeks, 38 weeks, and 40. All patients must be seen at the district, at the clinic at 40 weeks. And if then they are post dates, right? So they get to 40 weeks, then they must be referred to the hospital for an induction, which must be no later than 41 weeks. And also just a question on the previous season, we are generally doing, we have a problem of obstetric hemorrhage. So we're generally doing the scissors electively at 39 weeks. But if the patient's a previous scissor times two, that you don't have a scan that is early less than 24 weeks, then that patient needs to have their scissor at 38 weeks rather than the 39 weeks. So for the previous scissor to avoid them going to labor and the problems of actually, um, okay. So hypertensive disorders, before patients have hypertension, most of them, so the whole point of doing this antenatal, the whole point of changing the frequency of the visits for the patients was actually purely for us to detect hypertensive disorders and really to manage anemia. So anemia is a very bad risk factor for patients with HIV. So you need to manage your anemia and have clear protocols for anemia. But then the other one is hypertension. And before you can see the hypertension, and most of the time you start off with a placental ischemia, which will then cause an IUGR. So a lot of us, people don't know their days, they don't have electro ultrasound. So how are you supposed to detect? So really, you know, if you have the antenatal card, please look at the antenatal card. And on the antenatal card, you'll see that some of the patients will have, will be on the will be on the 10th centile or below which could be, and then others will be on the 90th. So the twins, the polyhydramnios, you know, could be on the upper part, right? On the, on the 90th centile. And then most people will be on the 50th centile. So you must familiarize yourself with this graph. I just want to talk to, how do you, if let's say somebody knows their dates, they are sure they 100% they had an early scan. How does this graph get plotted? I think whether you're a doctor, you must know how to plot this graph so that you can also look at the problems and be able to look at it. So if I know that the patient has an LMP and has got an early scan is 30 weeks, you first make a circle of 30 weeks on the gestational age line. So there's my line going down. And then you go on to measure the synthesis fundal height. And when you've measured the synthesis fundal height, you will find the synthesis fundal height will be the blue line. So what you're going to plot is where the blue line and the red line meet. And that would be where you plot the patient and then you continue with other visits. Okay, so now what do you do if somebody, so that's how the, the card will actually be plotted. Sometimes the line is imaginary, but people can even draw the line if they're not sure. Uh, but what if,
someone doesn't know their dates, they're booking late, you don't know what's going on, all you can work with is a synthesis finder height. So if you, you're working with a synthesis finder height, you don't know the dates, you actually draw a line on the synthesis finder height, as you can see with my red arrow. And then you take the synthesis, you draw an arrow to where the, you, we're doing guesswork most. So you will assume the patient will be in the 50th centile, and then you draw a line where the, the, the 50th centile actually meets the, the dot with the synthesis final light. And therefore, if that was 26, then you can say this patient is 27 weeks. So that's what you have. And the most important thing, and anyway, after you've estimated the gestational age at 27 weeks is to see the trends, whether she stays there or she drops or she goes out beyond in the follow-up visit. So that's why this is very important. Okay, just talking about hypertension. So I'm saying hypertension kills colleagues and we have seen that what, which, which patient, so if you can see that from 26, 14, there were 95 deaths and now we had 62 deaths from hypertension. What are the problems? Is the GPH, is the proteinuria that we're mismanaging as well as the patient with eclampsia that are dying. So, and then the other problem is that people take patients who have got preeclampsia, they take them to theater in a district hospital setting, do spinals, and that creates complications. And then the third thing is that Patients who have preeclampsia or gestational hypertension are prone to have an embolus. So that's the next issue. Then the patients could die of emboli. So I think it is very important that we know this thing and that these patients need to get it. So what is new? You, I'm going to rush through this. What is new is this issue of prehypertension. So all of us know that systolic blood pressures of 140 or diastolics of 90 defined hypertension. If they are persistent and you can check it an hour later, that was, or 30 minutes to an hour later, then that was persistent and you are fine. But what is emerging is this thing of prehypertension. So when you see any patient in pregnancy with BPs of 135 to 139 or 85 to 90, you call this prehypertension. And when you see patients with prehypertension, you must know that these patients are going to develop hypertension. Whether it's pre, whether it's pre, but it's actually important that you know they're going to develop hypertension and you actually have to deal with that. Now, the second thing is, now you've got two types of patients. Patients who then have pre develop hypertension. So you want to classify them into two groups. The ones who have got risk factors or the patients who have no risk factors, right? So what are the risk factors that someone is going to have preeclampsia in this pregnancy? So you've got the ones that have previous preeclampsia, the ones who are chronic hypertensive, the ones who have got uh, BMIs of more than 35, and those who had SLE, SLE is like this whole thing of BPs, renal failure, recurrent miscarriages, and all those patients that have assisted reproductive. So those patients are prone to getting preeclampsia. And then in the current pregnancy, if the patients have twins, right, uh, it's, also, it's actually a risk factor for, for, for this. So it's important that you check a person's blood, blood, blood pressure or any patient you see by an ANC. You see the patient and then you establish do they have risk factors? Even before they are hypertensive, do they have risk factors for hypertension? If you notice that the patient has risk factors, instead of giving them iron and folic acid, then it means that they are paired prevention strategies, the use of aspirin. There are many debates about the dosage, but it has been found that 100 to 150 milligrams is better than 75. So the recommendation is that these patients from as early as 12 weeks, when they get their iron, their folic acid, they must get their calcium, at 500, and in addition with that, they say at IFC, they must get the aspirin, which is at 150. So when do we call it severe? It's when your BPs are 160, systolics or the diastolics are more than 110. Now, I want to caution, there is a tendency for people to give all patients this nifedipine, even if the BPs don't exceed 160, 110. Colleagues, this kills patients, or this causes a hypotension that may affect the fetus, cause abruptions, or cause IUGR. So it's very important that you have a target of just lowering the blood pressure to 140 or to 150 and 90 to 100. So the adult is only indicated in that context. If there is no, the, the BPs are okay, then you don't need the adult. Um, and then the other thing is that you always have to take the bloods because you're checking what you're checking the UN, this is the urea, the creatinine, the AST is HP, looking for HELP syndrome. And really, the other thing is you need to assess the features for growth restriction. So you go back to the chart, you look at the plotting, 
and we check see if the baby is growing, if the mother is gaining weight, and if there is a problem with that. And so, what are the, and then what is your examination? So I've talked to you, you, you go to your BPs, you go to if there was a history, you check if the BPs are elevated, and then you actually check if there is end organ damage. So what then drives the end organ damage? If you see the picture in front of you, when you have a patient with preeclampsia, there is a failure of that second wave of trophoblastic invasion. So what these small spiral arterioles that you see, then what will happen is that it, does, they, it doesn't develop into a high capacitance vessel like you can see in the normal pregnancy. They remain narrow, vasoconstricted, and when they're vasoconstricted, they damage the endothelium and then they damage the red blood cells. And that will cause consequences like hemolysis. It will cause consequences like edema fluid will shift out of the third space. It will cause consequences like the vessels are too narrow. Then there will be sequelae. So it's very important. Why are patients dying? It's because people, all of you know how to give Maxalf and, and, and prevent and just give the Maxalf. But what you are not doing is actually looking for the complications and identifying them. So, and you take the blood, the urine dipsticks, but two things kill patients. It's the intracerebral hemorrhage and it's the pulmonary edema. So I don't know how many of you have last taken a respiratory rate in a patient, but what happens is that if the patient is edematizing the hands and the face, they leak fluid, they leak into the intravascular space, and then they have pulmonary edema. And that may be the symptoms will develop late. So it's actually important that you examine the patient posteriorly at the lung basis to look for the bilateral basal crepitations. Then in terms of the headaches, you know that it's the cerebral edema. And what's happening to the blood vision is when the blood vessels, they start popping and rupturing, and then it causes this blood vision because there's retinal hemorrhages. So those are severity signs, and you actually have this liver failure. So remember that this thing of this uh, myogen for patients with epigastric pain in pregnancy, before you start giving myogen, cimetidine, you must ask yourself, is there a risk factor for preeclampsia here? Could this patient be hypertensive? Because what you tend to have is you have hemolysis and then you can have little bleeders and then you can have a capsular hematoma and that capsular hematoma can burst. And on the fetal side, these patients will present with abruption, still burst, and then with IUGR, which is what you're saying. So the ultrasound, it's not good enough to just write the PPTs and the ETT. You must look, is the fluid enough? Is, you know, what is the AFI on the fluids? And those of you who know how to do Doppler's will do that. Lowering the blood pressure is very important. So I've talked to the indications and all district hospitals go back and check, do you have lapitalol in your institution? If you do have lapitalol, you must know it comes in a, in a vial, you mix it in 200 and then you give it at 24 to 80 milligrams, right to a maximum of 300. And then you repeat every 10 minutes until BP is low, but you start with nifedipine to a maximum of four doses. And then if the nifedipine doesn't work, you can use the lapitalol. CHs don't have lapitalol. So how are we then? So I said most of the patients will die of pulmonary edema. If they don't die of pulmonary edema, they're going to, to then, um, they're gonna die of pulmonary edema. So how do you then treat my pulmonary edema? So the first thing, left ventricular afterload, you need to give them isopyrinate, it's five milligrams. So that's what most of us have, right? We'll give that. Then Lasix, right? So you lecture the respiratory rate, if it's more than 30, then the patient is, is, is actually not well. So you normally give 40 milligrams of laces and then every 30 minutes. So I think as a way of remembering most of the things in, in hypertension, it's 30 milligrams, 30 minutes, every 30 minutes, everything. So then you repeat it after the, the laces. So it's more important colleagues that when you think you have a patient with primary, you just don't write 40 milligrams and walk away. You write 40 milligrams and you say, recheck the rate after 30 minutes. And then if still high, then repeat the dose of 80 milligrams. Then the patient can go to the ward. And then if then in the ward, they still are short of breath, you need to repeat this Lasix every 30 minutes until you actually get a, a lower rate. And then if they, they are tachypneic morphine will actually help them. And then you need to maintain oxygenation. So this is where now this high flow, you can use the CPAP or the high flows if you can't, if oxygen on its own or the rebreather mask doesn't help. Then the patient needs to be transferred because, but if you are having a, a serious patient with, you can actually put them on the, on the CPAP, which you now have in your district hospitals. And then no preloading of patients, right? No fluid loading. You don't have to preload anyone. And then 
If you have a patient, you need to put a 200 mil line and you close the line for in transit. And then if the patient is in a tertiary hospital where they can control, they have an IVAC, then they need to control the fluid at a maximum of 80 minutes per, 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 per hour. And remember, if the person is getting max half, max half normally is given at 50 minutes per hour. So it means that you need to give the other fluid at 30 minutes per hour. With the total fluid for the patient with preeclampsia must be 80 minutes. So there are these charts, I'm not gonna to talk to them. You can look at these algorithms, they should be in your facility. But I just want to stress the things that are there that I have already summarized. Prehypertension patients must come back within three and seven days. And then if the patients have no protein, then you start antihypertensive. If the patient have hypertension with risk factors, né? but no protein, then we said we're going to do the low dose aspirin, right? And then any patient that presents with hypertension less than 32 weeks is probably going to develop pre, pre uh, is going to develop preeclampsia. So those patients cannot stay at the clinics, even if they have no protein, even if they have no problem, they need to be sent to the district hospital so that a comprehensive assessment can be, can be done. Uh, and then if the patients have protein, definitely all patients, one plus protein, two pluses or more needs to go to a regional or a tertiary hospital where there's 24 hour Caesar and they need to go with Mexal for the transit. District hospital, I said, you, your ultrasound needs to include the estimated weight in AFI. Those of you who can do Dopplers, you can learn. Antenatal care clinic, you need to do a CTG. Antenatal CTGs on patients with hypertension must be done at 28 weeks. All patients must complete the fetal movement key chart. And then when there's doubtful issues of protein, you do, you do a urine MCNS because it could be infection, and then you can do a spot urine or you send the urine for a 24-hour urinary protein. The follow-up of the patient is ideally weekly, but you know, this, this care should be at the district hospital and some clinics can be so far. So we need to manage. And then delivery at 38 weeks, admit the patient at 38 weeks, then plan your induction because between 38 and 40 weeks, the patient will be, develop secondary eclampsia, preeclampsia. So it's very important that at 38 weeks, these patients must be admitted. And then postpartum, we need to really know the choice of drugs. First choice of, choice of drugs, now these patients will be managed at district hospital level. Enalapril is the first choice because it's a drug for heart failure and patients post delivery are prone to heart failure. It can be increased up to 20. And the second drug will be amlodipine, five milligrams can be increased up to 10. And I think if the patient now needs a third drug, that patient is not very stable. Everyone likes to use HCTZ, but in patients who had no pregnancy, no pre hypertension before, they don't really need HCTZ. They actually think that they need. The ones who get HCTZ are those who have chronic hypertension and we stick to 12.5 and I'll skip this. So I want to emphasize that all patients that are the Asina, the regional and tertiary hospital get given treatment for one month. So what will happen is they must be seen at the postpartum day six, they will be returned to the district hospital for evaluation. The district hospital must see them day six at two weeks and quickly until they reach one month. At one month, if the BP is fine, then the patient can then uh, go and stay without treatment for two weeks and then be seen at the six week visit. Otherwise, if then the BPs are coming too low, then you can just remove the drugs, you know, stepwise decrease the drugs. Then last, I hope we feel okay. Are you still there? Yes, okay. thank you very much. Just keep going and then we can, we can check for some okay, questions. Fine. Sorry. So I told you that our key problem for Eastern Cape is hemorrhage, guys, right? It is hemorrhage. Who is dying? You can see there bleeding during Caesar. Most people will close the Caesar and very people die on the table. You can see there were only four people who died out of a total of 62 patients. But bleeding after the Caesar, it seems like people close patients when they are, have not achieved full hemostasis. And when they've closed those patients, the monitoring may be inadequate and therefore the patients are dying of bleeding after the cesarean section, right? And then this issue of ruptured uterus is also improving, but there is a, don't only think that ruptured uterus will happen in patients with, with previous season. It can happen, especially with this mesoprostol usage. So what do we want to do? We need to, when we're transferring patients that have bleeding, so whether it's the bleeding after Caesar or what, we need to transfer them. If the patient is post-NVD, you need to transfer the patient in a life wrap. 
which is called a nurse. If the patient is post-seizure, we need to put this anti-shock garments to do the transfers. Let, let's look at why. A lot of the time you think a patient is stable in front of your eyes. So this was an analysis of 120 patients. So I said to you that you focus on the shock index. And what is the shock index, right? We said it's the what? We said it's the pulse divided by the systolic blood test, right? It should be less than 0 0.9. If it's more than 0 0.9, patient is bled, is shocked. But once it's more than 1.7, so I'm making an example, when the patient's BP pies is running at 145 and their BP is running at 80, then their shock index is actually at 1.7. So now in your practice, you must always focus on these uh, shock indexes. And then, but if you can see these patients, these patients seemed like they had a shock index. Then, but look at them, two of them had unrecorded BPs, but now you think everything is fine, you transfer them, but 31%, 31 of those patients on arrival at the next level, at the next facility, they actually find, come arrive there with unrecorded BPs, having played on the road, especially if the HP is also low. So what, why is it important that even if you think the patient is stable in front of you, you put the NASC so that they can be optimized on the road. So what does the NASC do? So if you can look at my picture, you can see that on the top picture, the patient is in decompensated shock. And where is the, the blood? There's bleeding vaginally, there's venous congestion in the buttocks, and you see a lot of the fluid is sitting in the leg. What do you do when you do the, when you put a NASC? When you put a NASC, you, you, you do give compression of the leg vessels. It doesn't create a tonic eh? And then you also compress the abdomen. And then when you do that, it's, it's actually important that you bring back the fluid into the central circulation. As you can see there, the, 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 the venous congestion is better. Most of the blood is in the brain and in the heart, and this actually saves lives. And then what, what are the effects then of putting the NAS? It reduces the hemorrhage in the lower body. Uh, it does not cut off the circulation to the legs, but you don't make it tight. And it decreases arterial perfusion pressure. And this is, in fact, its, it's effect is equivalent to the ligation of the internal arteries. And then you can overcome the pressure in the capillary and the venous system. And then it reduces the transmural pressure and its effect can be visible within 15 minutes of use. It, once you put it on, you leave it on and it can be left on for about 48 hours. And it will reduce the number of patients. It will reduce the number of, uh, of patients. Uh, it decreases the risk that even if when a patient arrives at the next level, they won't have a hysterectomy. And it's important for transport. So. Now, in the district hospital, when you're transporting a patient, you need to actually look at some temporizing measure. It's not good enough to say so. If the bleed, patient is bleeding from an NVD, then it's important that you're actually going to put a balloon, you, you're going to examine, examine the vagina, examine the cervix, check if there's retained products. And remember, colleagues, you don't do this thing of a bleeding patient. You actually say, I'm removing products of conception in the ward. You take the patient to theater, you put them in the totomy, you examine properly the cervix, and then you use a swab holder to actually look if there's products of, of conception. If there's products, you remove them. And then after that, you can actually put a, a uh, what do you call this thing now? A balloon tamponade. And this is maybe even if it's the CHC to transfer the patient to the next level. But if the patient was then now bleeding, she had a scissor, and she's continuing to bleed after the seizure. Then you need to look at a uterine tonic with the NAS. So I'm gonna show some figures for these figures. So I said post NVD, you're going to put, because even if they have a uterine rupture, you're going to put the balloon tamponade. All of you can practice how to do that. Now prevention of this bleeding. So if you are doing a seizure, you've got a patient that's atonic or you deliver twins or you deliver the placenta and you thought it was a bit ragged and there was a retroplacental clot, it's very important that during the season, you do what you call a uterine compression suture. There is a modified ways to actually do this. If you have closed the season, you can actually do a modified delinch, which is called Heyman's, where you put two stitches separately, and that can actually give you a uterine compression. And then you can transfer the patient or close the patient after you put the compression stitches. And also this applies to a patient where she was oozing and there was bleeding, and you realize that, you know what, I've already lost a thousand mils of blood here. I cannot afford any further blood loss. So it's better to do 
the compression stitch prophylactically to prevent further complications. And the other way of preventing the complications is you do the prophylactic stitch. And then after you do your scissors, all your scissors, you must put 20 units of oxytocin in a drip and run the drip at, uh, at, at least one liter every eight hours. And if you do that, it's actually going to bring the uterus, keep the uterus contracted and therefore reduce the chances of bleeding even after the scissor. Okay, what if you are in theater? We need to learn this stepwise devascularization. So the, this is covered in the video on the second slide screen. And it's very clearly illustrated in the lecture. It's very simple, three centimeters below your incision. You need to just make sure there's no ureter and then you need to put a stitch. Just catch the, 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 the uterine artery and just bind it up with the, with, the, with the uterine wall. And then if you have no experience, you are not happy with your scissor, you think she's bleeding, she's oozing, and you, you don't know what to do. The, and even once the scissor is bleeding a lot, we can put a uterine, which is a fully catheter tourniquet. So all you need to do is to wrap this tourniquet at the base of the uterus, wrap it tightly, and it will compress your uterine. And then you close. People ask me, then what do you do? Use a bigger foley and then tie it tightly at the base of the, of the uterus, put some swabs, and then you close the sheath and you close the skin, right? And you transfer to the next level of care. So when she arrives there, if you can put a drain, you put a drain. When she arrives at the next level of care, they're going to resuscitate her, give her blood and FTPs. Then they're going to reopen the patient and then they will remove your uterine tourniquet. So colleagues, I want to say, if you've done a scissor, if you were bold enough to go and do the scissor, if the patient is deteriorating the vitals, don't say, I'm sending her to the next level. You have to do a temporizing measure. So which is you need to go back open, put a 20K and then put the patient on the nurse and then transfer the patient to the next level of care. So the nurse, what happens if there's a live baby? You don't put it in with, with patients with, a, with heart conditions, but if the patient has an abruption with a dead baby, we can still put it on, right? And it's very also important in transferring the abruption. So all the techniques that I've described, all the skills, you must go and watch the ESMO. Madeline has shared the link with the surgical skills module and the obstetric hemorrhage, and then how to apply the NASC on this website, the Tiger. And then people apply this, and this is what a patient looks like after a NASC. So you can see the segments one, two, three. You can see the pelvic segment. And then what is nice about the abdominal segment is got a ball that keeps the uterus compressed down so that what will happen is that after you've given all your drugs, oxytocin drugs, the uterus will remain compressed down. And then at the end of the day, it will reduce your bleeding and your relaxation of the uterus and, and on route. When the patient arrives at the tertiary hospital, you do not remove the mask. If you are going to ex explore in theater, the patient has a mask, you go into theater with the mask on, open the legs and do what you've got to do, remove the product and all that. If the patient needs a surgery, you're going to just remove only the segments in the abdomen, and then you do your operation and you put them back. Why? Because you need to check that you, the patient may be falsely, you may get a false sense that the patient is unstable. But I think that you need to actually do the removal. After the patient's for two hours, everything's perfect, operation is done, all the vitals are, are done. Then you, in a monitored high care setting then, if your BPs are good, more than 90 and your pulse is less than 100, good IV access, you have a resource trolley, then you're going to remove the mask. And then what do you do? You remove one segment at a time. You start from one, two, three, four, five, and then uh, what will happen is that if you've removed the mask, and after you remove, there's this rule of 20. If the BP falls by 20 or the pulse increases by 20, then you know that it was actually the mask that was actually yielding the results. Otherwise, then a uh, patient is still not well resuscitated. You still need your bloods and your FTPs and more fluid. And then you need to check for if there's ongoing bleeding, if the patient after NAS removal. So I think that uh, that is so, then you can remove the NAS. So I, I think that there's a room for us to practice these. So remember, in obstetrics, colleagues, if you don't do your drills, we can do these lectures, the ESMO but you need to practice the clinical scenarios, which are actually your fire drills. And what does a fire drill do? You create, there is a drill and of which that fire drill is based on a, a, a death, you know, 
on actual scenarios of a death that happened. So I think it's very important that in your facilities, you go back, you look for the fire drills, you practice one, you practice your responses so that when it happens, and also the videos, if you watch them frequently enough, when you encounter an emergency, you will feel like you've, uh, you've done this before, and yet you would not have done it, but uh, you would actually, you will actually be able to handle the emergencies. So I uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. I hope you, it was clear. Uh, I didn't put my video on, but okay, I'm going to take questions and hand over to Madeline before we start showing you the whole issue of the K2. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mondondo. Wow, that was a whirlwind, but I think that was amazing in giving us those key things that can cause so much stress late at night, but gives us tools to actually save our patients' lives. And I think the important thing that Dr. Mondondo has said is that she's given you clues of things you need to capacitate yourself on. One can't learn something this simply by listening to a presentation. So that Tigerberg course, um, if you also just Google Tigerberg and ESMO E, it's an excellent, excellent ESMO E course with videos and presentations very worthwhile to go through those and organize drills at your own hospital till you feel confident to manage a situation like that, um, 11 o'clock on a Friday night, for example. Um, we can take questions. You can either put them on the chat. I've noticed there's no questions on the chat at the moment, or you can put your hand up if you'd like to ask Dr. Mondondo anything before we're gonna move on to a second part. Um, I did say earlier, if anybody needs to leave at seven, that's absolutely fine. We are gonna be recording all of this. Just please put your name, who you, where, where you're working, uh, where you're from and your email address if you want these presentations on the chat. Um, but just let's just check, is there any questions at the moment? Yes, Mr. Sufuba, you can unmute yourself. Was he serious? Okay, I would like to ask. Uh, I would like to ask how many scans uh, in what gestation are we supposed to send a patient for scans? All right, must I answer immediately? I think, right. I think let's just go one, one by one. There's not too many questions at the moment. Okay, no, the, what, the most important thing, it depends on the condition. But ideally, we would like all patients scanned before 24 weeks. So the first scan okay. which we're going to be using is our baseline scan should be before 24 weeks. So now yeah. whether the patient needs repeated scans depends on the condition. If it, you start detecting IUGR or problems or or increasing growth or whatever. That's the, the context where you're going to start um, uh, looking at, yeah, at, at, uh, at that, at, at doing more scans like diabetics or the patients with hypertension. Then when they hit 34 weeks, it's very important to know what's the gestation, what's the estimated fetal, what was the AFI. So I think there is no fixed answer to like, this is the number of scans that you need, but in principle, so it depends on the condition. Thank you very much, Dr. Mondondo. Um, Fortune is next in line with a question. Fortune Bengu, you can unmute yourself. Hello. Dr. Mondondo was talking about giving Adalat. I missed that. Yeah. Yes, just clarify your question. Hello. Yes, continue. I'm not sure, it's, it's Fortune Bengu here. Yes, uh, we, can it, you, we can hear okay. you. Go Matt, okay, good evening, everybody. Dr. Mandanda, I just have a question which uh, bothers me a lot. When we put in us on patients who are in theater, uh, our problem with that one, with that, I, I think it's number four, with a ball, the one for abdomen, they usually complain of pains. So I don't know what, how can we tackle that because that's the one that we usually want to compress the, 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 the uterus. Even if we put up so many um, analgesics, but they usually complain of, uh, of pains during, uh, uh, I mean, when we put it. 
So what can we do uh, with that? Thank you. Okay, I mean, I'm assuming you're putting this uh, NASD to transfer the patient to the next level. So, because that's the only context, right? It's when you're transferring. So I, I think that if uh, like you've got the wound, uh, I think maintaining the oxygen is very restless. You can just take off the second, the one that has got the ball, but 20 units of oxygen in that drip. And then if it's needed, you need to give the IMI. Uh, oxyto the, the syntometrin as well. Oh, okay, so we can leave it. It's not a problem. Yeah, you can leave the abdominal segment. Okay, if you have a patient of bleeding, ne? the first yes. thing is not the nurse, is to open the abdomen, open your incision, look at the chest. Then if you think it's atonic, you put a bilinch. If you can devascularize, you can do the, the uterine artery ligation and then put a drain. If you can put a drain, close the abdomen, right? If you are satisfied that everything is perfect, the question is, do you still need to put a mask? But if you are unhappy, you are in tears, and you are unhappy with your patient and everything, then you put a tonic, you put a mask, and now you Putting the last book, trying to turn the patient. Doc, you're, bro you're breaking up a little bit. Maybe just say that last sentence once again. So then you can put the last. And if uh, it becomes Dr. extremely unhealthy, well, I mean, I guess there's nothing we can do. She's going to, and only the pelvic segment is very effective. Dr. Mondondo, would you just uh, repeat that last two sentences again? This, the line went a little bit poorly there. Okay, I'm saying if the pelvic segment is very important, so if she's very uncomfortable about abdominal segment and we really have to remove it, we'll remove it as long as all the other segments are still on whilst she's being transferred. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. That's very helpful, those little practical things. I just want to see if there's um, any more hands up. Uh, Mrs. Sifuba, do you still want to ask a question? If not, you can just lower your hand.